little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Well, firstly, hello, by the way. How are you? <laughs> How rude of me. Um, right, I've got two events coming up. The first one is free. Yay! It's uh, a teacher training open day at Carson Lock Yoga Hub, 27th of July. So if you're thinking about starting 200-hour foundation teacher training and you'd like a bit of info, um, come down. It's free. It's on 27th of July, Saturday. It'll be roughly about an hour and a half. We're going to have bolsters for you, comfy stuff to sit on, bring a pad and a pen, ask any questions that you you may have and maybe get to meet future trainees that could be your colleagues one day. Dun, dun, dun. The other event we have is, well, I have, is um, a handstand workshop, Heels Overhead, which is July 6th, so a couple of weeks before that. Uh, it's two o'clock in the Elbe Room. All of this information, if you go to my website kevinboyyoga.ie forward slash events and retreats you can find everything there and check it out so let me let me ask you a little question have you ever heard the old irish proverb it could be english buy cheap buy twice have you ever heard pay peanuts get monkeys well this can be said for many things cars jewels clothing false economies of scale of scale buying cheap stuff that don't last well don't do that don't be like i was last week going down to enable island shout out to them taking down a big bin liner of clothes that uh, were just rubbish after a few washes get down to on apparel and if you can't get down there go and see them online because they don't have a physical shop just yet get on to om.com forward slash hashtag to ylp so om.com, otherwise known as Om Apparel, men's clothing company that like to create quality clothing with the environment and men's health in mind. A lot of their stuff is made from recycled polyester. They believe in looking after the environment and encouraging more men to get on the mat. I've got a lot of their gear and I pretty much live in their Voyager trousers, particularly the black ones. Because uh, you can wear them to yoga and then you can wear them out afterwards if you want to go for coffee, for brunch or whatever digital nomads do so if you want to check out their gear all you've got to do is go to om.com forward slash hashtag tyolp pick out your gear and then you put in the promo code kevin and you get 15 percent off so that's om o h m m e dot com forward slash hashtag tyolp as in the yoga life podcast put in the promo code kevin at checkout for 15 percent off your clobber next up we have 108 asana yoga sequencing cards by yoga Roo. Simplifying your yoga practice, because you know sometimes you wake up in the morning, you have your coffee or your your smoothie, stand at the top of the mat and you, your mind draws a blank. You don't know what to be practicing and how to put your practice together, how to develop it, how to regress it, progress it. Well, if you use these cards designed by Ruth Delahunty down at Yoga Roo, you're able to get access, instant access, no internet connection to physical cards that will tell you alignment cues the English or Sanskrit translations, level guides, anatomy coding. And all of that stuff can really help you to develop a home practice as opposed to practicing online or just making up as you go along. So check out yogaru.ie, put in the promo code Kevin, you get 10% off. That's yoga, R-U, dot I-E, promo code Kevin for 10% off your deck of cards. Last up, we have Pada and small changes. So... Small Changes are based down here in Drumconjure. They're a whole food store that specialise in local produce, organic, trying to do their best to help the environment, help the local community. There's no online offer at the moment, but if you're in the Dublin area, Drumconjure and soon to be in Glasnevin, in my neck of the woods, check them out. Maybe you want to look at them online first, smallchanges.ie. Feel free to say that Kevin sent you. Uh, I don't get any commission, but yeah, why not spread the love? So today we have with us Justin Wolfer. Justin was in Dublin a couple, last week when he was teaching his workshop. And he's actually, he's back. He's going to be back in September uh, 22nd to teach his workshop, his movement mapping certification course, which is over three days. So it's not a workshop, it's actually a course. And um, I became aware of Justin after he collaborated with, with Devin, with Devin Kelly, who is a, a Logo Life podcast alumni. 
And uh, yeah, Justin, uh, Brian, shout out to Brian Malone, who brought Justin Long here to the studio, to my house. We had a cup of tea, had a chat and uh, talked about all kinds of things. I like just Justin because, well, apart from being a stellar chap, he's also believes in multidisciplinary movement. So he's not just fixed on one type of physical practice. And also he, he's, he advocates modern research on the brain, the body, the nervous system. So he's, um, yeah, he's doing some interesting stuff and uh, he's also a thoroughly nice man. So I hope you enjoy this podcast with Justin. Without further ado, here's the intro music. Let's do this. What's up, Justin? Hey Kevin, how are you, man? Good man, how you doing? Good man. Good, <laughs> Good to finally meet you. Uh, we've the power of Instagram. We, um, I, I'll give people some context. I, I, I did a. I used well. I still train jiu-jitsu, and uh, I had a post up of me sweaty after jiu-jitsu, and um, I, I was already, I was already following you already because I was I was um, um, referred. Or I was told about you by the people, and then when you reached out to said that you started jiu jitsu, I was like, oh, okay. So and then we had a conversation, and uh, you said that you're moving to Guernsey, which is now where you now live, and uh, and here we are. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so are you still doing jiu jitsu? Um, well, I just had a uh, son. My wife had our uh, son. He's five months old, and uh, so I haven't been. Uh, doing jujitsu for a while, um, and uh, I did just move to Guernsey, so uh, we've mm -hmm. gone through a pretty significant process of uh, coming from America. Uh, I had to get my UK visa, so there was a, a a long time where I was sort of the stay-at-home caregiver um, for our son, mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah, so it's been an adjustment in that way. That uh, I, I was talking to the students uh, this weekend uh, about about sort of the volume of, of practice and training that I get these days is, is much less than what I'm used to. Yeah, I, yeah. I was going to say that actually because I did see for doing my research that you, 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 you and your wife just had a, another child and uh, it must be more challenging to when you become a father become a parent to keep up a regular practice you know f for example I don't have kids and every morning there's nothing to stop me getting up and doing my practice um, which I can do um, do you, is there is there gyms in Guernsey where you could train where you could train if you wanted to jiu-jitsu there is uh, there's one yeah there's there is one space that that is um, a jiu-jitsu school yeah. um, and uh, yeah I've been in contact with him I, I had every intention of starting uh, but yeah life life happened and uh, um, well you got a lot going on in fairness <laughs> yeah yeah a lot of a lot of great things and and uh, you know this this time was uh, for me uh, even though at at times it it, it was it felt uh, uh, the whole process of getting your visas is, is uh, very uncertain. So um, they don't tell you you know up until the day that they approve it if if you're good to go. And and we had already moved our whole life to Guernsey, um, and so that that was a little nerve nerve wracking. But uh, mm -hmm. but the time that I actually had it was sort of like a for forced paternity leave for me and uh, I got to spend so much time with my children um, and especially my son which I didn't have that experience with my daughter uh, I was working all the time while my wife was the primary care caregiver and uh, mm. uh, it's been it's been really neat to, to just watch him grow up so mm. yeah well, why did you choose Guernsey my wife is uh, Guernsey born and okay. uh, we we met in New York uh, she had um, she was uh, going to school in New York and uh, uh, up until that point I had no idea that Guernsey existed <laughs> and uh, I've been now traveling a bit in Europe and I'm happy to hear that a lot of other people don't know that Guernsey uh, exists so uh, yeah it's uh, but uh, it's interesting I was just in Greece um, doing a, a retreat in uh, Mykonos and uh, the Greek islands uh, are world renowned for their beauty and uh, I, I was thinking on that retreat it was 
absolutely beautiful where I was, but uh, uh, Guernsey is is equally as beautiful. It's mm. a absolutely gorgeous island, and uh, I love the the people there and the community. So it's in the Channel Islands below the UK, right? Yeah, it's it's closer to France, and oh, wow. uh, and we can actually from from our balcony we can see France. We can see the outline. Uh, I believe it's Normandy. Uh, we're close to. Um, and is, is there French speakers there? Is there only a French population? It's, it, there's a big French population there. Um, it's a lot of great French food and uh, uh, I think French influence in the architecture. It's, uh, it's really beautiful. Yeah. So, so you've got Rise, um, your Rise studio there, you've also got Rise in New York. Um, is that right? You say- we closed down that um, studio. Okay. So, yeah, it, it was actually uh, an uh, an interesting time for us because uh, we had uh, uh, been uh, we had that studio open for over four years. Um, it was uh, an absolutely beautiful space, and it was sort of my first and and something that I had worked so incredibly hard on and. Um, and we started to have ceiling leaks. So, uh, so we were in a five-story building on the second floor, and uh, and there was water, uh, and certain times that would just pour into our uh, space. Mm. And then we had these beautiful bamboo floors, and they would the water would sit or get underneath, and uh, and then the flooring started to warp, and uh, so. At a certain point, we we, we had to uh, uh, seek legal counsel. We we had to um, we were uh, our landlord was sort of a corporate uh, conglomerate, and they didn't really uh, address the situation and, and address the effect that it was having on us. Um, so it it was starting to sour the experience for me a bit, and uh, at the same time, uh, was my first visit to Guernsey, and uh, and when I went to Guernsey. I just uh, imagined my life there and my life with my kids. It's a very safe place. Uh, we're right near the the sea and uh, and some of these incredible hikes up these uh, these cliffs. To um, uh, and I was just like, yeah, let's uh, <laughs> let's go for it. And so yeah, we uh, we made that plan shortly after. Yeah, that's a big change from New York City. <laughs> yeah, well, we're slightly we're slightly north of New York City. We're um, uh, closer to Albany. Okay. Um, so just to, just above New York City, but uh, but yeah, it it's been a change. But uh, uh, I joke with uh, with my uh, um, English friends that uh, that it, the, you're you're pretty similar to us, even though you don't want to admit it. <laughs> it's, you know the whole Brexit thing, and you know you've got your problems too. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Because um, because. Um, uh, to give people some context as to how, like, um, why you're here in Dublin, you are, you've just finished teaching a workshop for the weekend, haven't you? And then you're going to yes. London next. Yes. Um, so, what the reason why I'm, I'm interested in your stuff is I I really want to do an FRC course for mm-hmm. a start. I mean, and that's what just part of what you do. But there's 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 so few and far between, especially in Ireland. There's you know you get a lot happening in the UK, but very rarely do you see them happen in Dublin. Um, so I'm on the lookout for one now. And the the reason why I think FRC and your stuff is so interesting is because I, it's so easy to uh, teach a, a a vinyasa class or traditional yoga, and I I I like the fact that more and more people are starting to question old ways of doing things and what is best for your body long term you know what type of movements so your workshops are called movement mapping Mm -hmm. is that right so how would you describe that (laughs) you know we it's funny we we uh talked about this uh over the weekend um because it's a it's a fairly new um, thing for me that uh, has sort of um, uh, emulsified over uh, a year or so of, of um, exploring uh, the applications of FRC um, and where it fit into the yoga paradigm and uh, and where it fits into uh, my other love, which is just sort of mixed movement um, interdisciplinary studies um, uh, and and sort of moving away from 
uh, maybe uh, fixed ideas of, of how things are, are supposed to be done. Um, and uh, another thing that I sort of d identified um, as a problem in the yoga community is, is teaching group classes and, and telling everything, everyone to do the same thing. Um, that that's certainly an, an easier path to, to, to sort of um, uh, getting maybe a good idea across. Um, but in terms of, of people's bodies, in terms of, of their capacities, it's, uh, uh, it's, it leaves a lot. Uh, I think, um, uh, at least in, in my uh, opinion, I think uh, we, we are uh, underserving certain populations, uh, maybe um, uh, causing confusion uh, by saying this is uh, always good for you or always bad for you. And, um, and so the, uh, the, the movement mapping uh, practice uh, is is meant uh, in, in uh, to sort of resolve some of those uh, those uh, at least uh, my approach towards resolving uh, some of those things and uh, uh, trying to uh, create a dynamic in in a group class where people are making their own choices um, within a framework uh, um, and they're using both. FRC mobility principles um, to improve their flows um, and also to assess what may need to be improved in terms of uh, what their joints are capable of, what um, why maybe they can't do certain things. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, if you're just sort of doing a group class, uh, a lot of times you'll see that uh, a couple of people get it right away, a couple of people don't get it. A couple of people shouldn't get it. And a couple of people, um, you know, are, are maybe uh, just confused as to why everyone else in the class is, is uh, doing it and seemingly happy while they're doing it. And mm -hmm. I'm just sort of left out in child's pose. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, I wanted to uh, uh, sort of uh, use the tools of both FRC, uh, and also my love of, of, of yoga. I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of gold there as well. Um, but, uh, that, that there are some blind spots and, uh, contextually, I think, uh, modern human beings have some blind spots in terms of their joint health and in terms of their, um, everyday general movement. Uh, mm -hmm. so if you jump into any class, CrossFit, uh, yoga, um, you know, Jiu-jitsu, uh, if you have weak joints, if you don't really move a lot, uh, you're probably asking for it, you know, in terms of, mm -hmm. of uh, you know, sustaining some sort of injury or, or just sort of being frustrated by the experience. So, mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that um, so much of traditional yoga is, is definitely beneficial, but um, it takes such effort to question everything. And for some people maybe most people it's easy just to go along and teach public classes and i've been thinking about this myself recently that the more my home practice is starting to be a little bit different to what i teach in class and it always be, it always used to be whatever i do at home i teach in class but now what i've realized is some people or in the class environment it, it's not the right environment a public class for an hour to introduce completely new system mm. and i occasionally will put in uh, bits of frc that i've learned myself um for friends or, or online but i've realized that not everyone is there for the same reason i'm there so i need to teach to the room as opposed to maybe the 10 percent of people that like i mean not everyone mm. some people want to do passive stretching they actually want mm -hmm. that you know and i just find now I'm, I'm I'm starting to re-examine um, how I how I teach what I practice because I do like that I mm. I, I do I, I'm not because um, I think that is the best way forward is to actually have learn a system where or teach a system where people can almost figure out on their own and you give them the tools to figure out. Sure. But it's difficult to do that in a public class. It is, it is. Um, yeah, and I think you bring up two really interesting things. Is uh, I, I think it's, uh, I know um, uh, within the yoga community of a lot of uh, teachers that um, don't practice what they're teaching anymore. Um, and that could be because they've maybe 
overdone the passive stretching things and um, uh, it, it can be uh, in some ways I think a little deceiving not not in light of what you're describing but um, uh, where we're again driving home this idea that the, you know that this is this is the path this is the balancing style of practice and um, and it was an idea that initially for several years when I began yoga I'm like this is the cure all this is going to be everything that you need and you should be doing yoga what's wrong with you you know and and, uh, and so anyways um, uh, yeah I mean uh, there's that is that uh, I think that there is sort of um, uh, some people get it and aren't saying <laughs> that they get it they're still teaching maybe what um, is making them money and and you know what i don't uh, i don't necessarily think it's it's, at the end of the day you you make a living the way that you make a living but um uh yeah and the the second thing i think that's that's interesting that you talk about is uh, is familiarity which is uh with the three-day course that i just did um there are components that are purposely in there for just familiarity Mm. and one of the things that i find with the frc is is that it's intellectually stressful that it's 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 actually (laughs) you're really thinking hard about every single thing that you do and it's not sustainable over a 60 minute class Uh, most people aren't there to think that hard and uh, they may be thinking that hard in their lives and um exactly yeah yeah sorry i I didn't no 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 Um, but some people come to class they want to switch off Mm -hmm. like i've noticed that my class can be very technical sometimes and i know some people it's exhausting they're like fuck it they're like yeah i'm not here for i'm not here (laughs) for a lecture i'm here to just move and breathe Mm -hmm. and i um so i've realized that what i try to do now is incorporate um, say like dynamic stretching but it, it into almost like a vinyasa flow mm. so it's a tiny it's maybe like 10 percent of the class is uh unconventional yoga and the rest of it is quite quite conventional yeah. because i um and i am i am slowly creeping in but it's a difficult mm. thing to um to to incorporate it yeah it really is um that's why i find handstands so interesting because I don't, I've really reduced the amount of workshops I teach. And now at the moment, I'm only interested in teaching handstand workshops mm-hmm. because it's a mix of, well, it's extremely technical, it's strength, but it is also flexibility. There's a, um, but I like the f- fact that it's, uh, you can have a real system towards something, mm. towards this uh, this specific thing. And I it excites me that I, I I gave up on handstand six months ago. Mm-hmm. I said I just I never used to do that. <laughs> I, I didn't have a yeah. system for learning. Sure. I just used to mess about. Mm. And now I've t- developed more of a system. And as I was yeah. saying to you earlier, I did, I did private with Devin Kelly in Bali last week, and um, he, you know, uh, has even more of a an in depth methodical approach. Sure. And that has as that. I think it's important to teach what excites yeah. you. Yeah, I, I you know, uh, that uh, maybe three, four years into my own teaching, I've been teaching for close to 10 years now, uh, I started to get interested in handstands and uh, um, I was doing it sort of the yogic way of just kick up 4,000 times and hope for the best. And, <laughs> exactly. um, and at a certain point, uh, somebody pointed me out um, or someone pointed me towards um, Idol Portal um, and uh, Gymnastics Bodies, which mm-hmm. is the uh, Chris Summers uh, online course. And uh, they introduced me to these ideas of prehabilitation of uh, breaking down the components of the handstand uh, uh, that uh, again you know as I was talking about it with any position uh, if you don't have the requirements for that position and then you just keep trying to force yourself to do it um, your body doesn't understand that and uh, quite often it just doesn't change or 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 we're going to just sort of cause some sort of degeneration Mm -hmm. and so i saw a lot of that with yogis they're getting hurt they're they're wrists they're shaking their hands Mm -hmm. Uh, even in down dog you know not even talking about just handstands but we're not preparing uh, students 
for the tasks that we're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. And so the whole handstand uh, practice that I learned from gymnastics was about preparing for maybe five handstands that you were going to do in a very measured way mm. and that you would, uh, and I, we did a handstand workshop this weekend as well. And, um, we, we took it out of the realm of, of this is a singular goal and that there are many just sort of attributes that this goal comprises and that we're going to learn to, uh, or develop them. Uh, through this practice and then carry that forward into uh, your practice moving forward. And so just by doing that as well, I think that uh, if you want to teach handstands, um, you can teach uh, handstands to someone that it's not a good idea for them to just jump up and do a handstand where we maybe teach the components of learning how to um, stabilize your wrist, uh, learning how to uh, elevate your scapula in a weight-bearing position that's suitable for what you're able to do so that everyone does a handstand practice, but maybe not everyone is balancing yet, you know, mm -hmm. so where we can... Um, make it accessible for the entire class, you know, and actually uh, give everyone in the class handstand work, whereas it, it quite often is there's three people that only came to do handstands. It's like, mm -hmm. this is the only part of the class I care about. I'm going <laughs> to do that part. And then the rest of the class is just sort of sitting out or, you know, child's pose or something like that. And, and in a sort of a, a group experience, you know, the, 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 there is a feeling of like being left out, you know, mm -hmm. that's something that I think is, is very fascinating in terms of the yoga, uh, what happens in a yoga room of, of, of trying to, you know, find our niche in within the practice. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think that, that, uh, uh, for, for teachers, um, to have more tools to understand where you want to take students and what it what it does take in terms of capacities, in terms of, of assessment, um, you're going to be able to teach what you want to teach um, and and do it uh, to a class of different capacities, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so the movement mapping, we basically we we build a flow, and that's sort of the arc of the class. So everything up until the point of when the, the flow is, is totally put together um, is sort of has to do with the flow and there could be handstands involved with that and bridging uh, components and there's all these funky movements rolling on the floor. And then after that, sort of the arc down is about what mobilities and what strengths do you need to develop on the side um, to improve the flow, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think I give, uh, or I, at least I try to sort of dangle a carrot there of like, this is what we're building towards. And then coming down, these maybe mechanical exercises that seem sort of boring or uh, whatever, um, they're, they're actually meant to help you do the flow, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, so, sort of like in, in my experience with handstand training is that, oh, shoulder flexion is going to really help here. Mm -hmm. uh, I should do shoulder flexion stretches, even though they they can be brutal and yeah, boring yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that. It's like, I'm going to do them because mm -hmm. This is an art. This is a practice, and mm. and so yeah. So that that's one of the uh, things that I'm trying to sort of bring to the movement mapping practice. Man, I would have loved to have gone, but I came back from Bali yesterday, mm -hmm. and yeah. you, and your workshop was on yesterday. So, uh, and Devin's workshop was on the same weekend. Yours right, was in right. Bali, so I know. I managed that, to get the... he, that jerk undercut me. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I managed to get the one the one song with him, but I absolutely love going to. Your, the workshops like yours or like Devon's because I really like the technical approach and I really like learning through the medium of a handstand because I found that if someone shows me one thing in handstand I notice it straight away mm. whether it's something to do with my uh, shoulder rotation or anything pointing my toes I, I you can think about handstand is like any little tiny uh, change you make you notice it straight away mm -hmm. and it's so satisfying it's kind of exciting because Doing a handstand is like what a child would do. You know, sure. kids, kids would cartwheel, do hands, put their legs up against the wall. And I think um, cracking that nut and then 
playing and learning more. I mean, I, I actually think now is like the beginning of my handstand journey. Mm. You yeah. Know, because yeah. press handstand and then we have a one arm handstand, hand balancing. And, um, and as you said, kicking up a thousand times is not going to do it. Mm. And, and I think the, the process of pr the prehab process as well is so important and having the patience and putting a bit of uh, thought behind what are you doing and why are you doing it um you mentioned Edel Portal did you go to one of his workshops or seminars or what was it I've never no I, I you know it's uh something again that I'm pretty excited about because uh, there seems to be a lot of uh opportunities in Europe to uh to to get to one and I feel like Europe oh, okay. is closer than uh, a lot of things in Europe are, are closer than in America. Um, yeah. So he comes to America a few times, but it's never been um, relatively close to, to where I was at the time. But I, I actually did um, one of his uh, online um, uh, coaching uh, okay. um, three-month uh, program. Uh, but I, I learn a lot from, uh, from, from seeing what he, he shares. And uh, I think his uh, one of his... Um, uh, I guess uh, tenets of, of of training of isolate integrate improvisation uh, has been something that that really uh, um, uh, has been a, a focus of my work and and again sort of the the mobility of the FRC was was the isolate you know and the isolation phase is is, is really boring. Um, and uh, like you described, if, of maybe uh, and something I suggested to some of the teachers or all of the teachers in the group um, this weekend was is, is if you just put 10 minutes of um, uh, what I call everyday essentials um, and the purpose of it is is, is, is sort of a flowing uh, cars type concept uh, where we flow through, uh, we're able to do it in five to 10 minutes, uh, you get a whole wide range of joint movement, um, which is very nourishing. It's accessible. It's non-weight bearing. It, it will prepare you for weight bearing uh, activities, um, but to, to use that in an interesting way so that students engage with what you're giving them, you know. So as you said, uh, and 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 it was my experience when I first started uh, teaching some of the FRC stuff is that uh, uh, students would come up to me after the class and say, "Wow, that that that's got to be really good for me." Mm -hmm. um, you know, I should do more of that. And then I would never see them again. <laughs> They'd be like, uh, I'm like, oh, it's good for you. And then I'm not, because because again, I I. I, I it, it frustrated me for a long time. And, um, I thought, you know, I need to be more, uh, loud about why this is important or, uh, whatever I tactics I tried, but, uh, um, I, I didn't understand something fundamental about human nature is that if people don't want to engage with you, then it doesn't matter if you're dangling something that is, you know, very valuable to them. Uh, they're not going to engage with it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, sort of having this very technical, slow, um, uh, it doesn't seem, uh, in, in the context of an hour, if I do, you know, these very slow rotations of your wrist and then your elbow and then your <laughs> shoulder, and that's the whole bulk of the class, that doesn't feel valuable to a lot of people. Mm. Um, so uh, even in my own day, I, part of part of uh, how I compress this had to do with being a parent and, and having a, a smaller window of time that I got to the point where I was just rolling through these exercises and not all of them were circles. Some of them were linear patterns and uh, horizontal patterns and, and uh, just sort of making sure that I mapped out my whole body uh, with some sort of soft soft tissue type uh, movement, non-weight bearing. Um, and I got quick at it and I got fluid at it and it was, it felt good, but it was more like Tai Chi than it was just stand here, move one, you know, move your wrist and then do the other one and then do the elbow and then do the other one. And, you know, that was that even boring to me so yeah so but, I, but like doing, <laughs> doing the morning cars i love doing the cars in the morning mm. because it's almost like uh an inspection of your body just mm. uh, yes I, I i mean doing my neck cars is one of my favorite things mm. to do but um that does controlled articular rotations by the way for people who don't know that uh that acronym um and by the way frc is functional range conditioning yes <laughs> <laughs> i'm just throwing that, throwing that about but um 
Jason Crandall once said, yoga, something like this, and I, I can't remember verbatim, but it's yoga shines light in the, into the darkest corners of your body. Mm. And I think that when you experience different movement methods, different physical practices, you start to realize what you're missing. Mm. And, and it, if you can be, if you can be like the best Ashtangi going, but if you're, um, I, I honestly feel like you should explore th- the process of learning. I mm. mean, it, when you, to, 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 to always, to never really be like, all right, I know what I'm doing completely. I'm going to do my, what I always do. Um, that's why I, I might yeah. get a bit of hate for this. Bikram doesn't really appeal to me doing the same sequence all the time. I know you can go deep into poses, but I like the idea of just learning. Mm. And I, and I think that's what, um, what's interesting about your workshops is that there's, they have so many components. I wanted to ask you about, um, your experience at Burning Man. Oh yeah. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Let's I, get to the real questions. <laughs> no, 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 one thing, and there is, there is actually, yeah. a, um, it's like, um, the reason why I bring Burning Man up is not just for like the hedonistic stories, but yeah. more so, uh, you mentioned something on your website about when you went to Burning Man, you met different types of people who were moving different ways, gymnasts, mm. um, dancers, acrobats. And I'm wondering how much that influenced your practice, your teaching. Yeah, it will. Uh, well, could you give us a bit of backstory first? Uh, sure, about, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, I went to Burning Man uh, once as a uh, single guy. And uh, I talked about it a lot because it, it, it was uh, it was a pretty um, uh, eye-opening experience for me. Uh, one of the things that uh, I remember from my first Burning Man, which was um, uh, I it was uh, actually at New Year's the the year that I went. Um, someone had mentioned it, and we just said, "We'll go. Let's do it." Um, and we ended up meeting in San Francisco. We drove in. I had no idea that uh, where it was and and uh, how you have to just drive into the middle of nowhere and uh, and get to this place. And it's a city that's built um, in a few days. Uh, it's there for seven days and then taken apart. And it's uh, the idea is is you leave no trace, so you have to bring everything and take everything from it. Um, and uh, it has some uh, some uh, tenants that uh, that uh, I found uh, really interesting. Uh, but then to to really ex- uh, experience them uh, was was uh, was so different than what I was used to in my everyday life. Uh, one of the, um, one of the concepts is, or the principles are, are that, uh, you participate, um, that you get involved, you know, and it's similar to what I'm talking about with engagement, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you have the option in your life to sort of, you know, be like, eh, I don't really feel like doing this. And in Burning Man, it's, it's, it's really encouraged to, you know, to participate, you know, as much as possible to get involved. It's a community. And it, again, it, 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 it works. Uh, people bring stuff not only for themselves, but to share. And, uh, you know, it, it, people somehow bring enough that everyone gets something and uh, there's there's something, you know, if you're in a random situation, someone's got something for you. And uh, um, uh, and I'm not talking about drugs. I'm talking about like, you know, a Band-Aid or, you know, <laughs> something like that. But uh, um uh, the the participative the the radical community the radical inclusiveness uh, that that um, you know everyone's welcome and we really mean it you know and there's an interesting thing that's happened recently about some wealthy uh, Google guys coming in and people the traditionalists aren't happy about it and they they camp in really expensive things and the the i guess the the burning man leaders are saying everyone's included that's what it means you know and uh, mm. uh, and i dig that i remember uh, coming home from it and being so depressed because uh, I came home, I met my friends, like, tell me about it. How many, you know, well, what happened? Da, 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 da. And, and uh, I looked at them, I'm just like, you know, the, the people that I met for the seven days, I'm closer to them than I am to you guys. I've known all my life, you know, it's like, 
it's so interesting how guarded we are, how superficial we are in terms of our conversations, in terms of in Burning Man, you know, you see someone and you hug them. That's the protocol. You know, you get close. They've got glitter on their chest, whatever it is. You know, it's like, yeah, OK, come on in. Come on. Then we're going to do this. <laughs> so uh, um, so that was cool. I mean, and and uh, and, and, you know, to, to actually to that, that was uh, about three years into my yoga practice. I didn't even see that at the studios. You know, everything that we sort of profess in yoga, um, it isn't like that. It's not uh, as as open and inclusive, and uh, we're all secretly <laughs> scowling at each other. And uh, they did something really incredible, I think, at Burning Man in, in facilitating that. And so, anyways, the the second time that I went, I took my wife because I'm like, you have to come to Burning Man at least once, uh, and I'd love to do it with you as as a, sort of a new experience for me. Um, <laughs> and a uh, couple of weeks before we went, we're getting ready. We're really excited. Da 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 da. I'm like, you should probably take a pregnancy test just because we just had this feeling that maybe we were pregnant, uh, and uh, we were. Um, <laughs> so she was. Uh, she had Veda, my my four year old daughter, in her belly for Burning Man, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so Veda is is a burner, and you can tell because she's wild <laughs> she likes to dance naked um but uh but yeah it, it was a it was a different experience for that because you know it's it's my wife was tired a lot of the time and it was a harsh climate and uh you know we we mainly stayed in and and uh um we would go to center camp uh and in center camp is great big tent in the middle of the desert it's like heaven you know to just have a little bit of shade <coughs> And uh, so there, there was this big space where uh, there were acrobats and there were dancers and there were martial arts and uh, acro yoga was going on. And, um, and it was so cool, you know, it was so cool to see people moving uh, as if other people weren't around and uh, also sort of moving with each other as well. You know, we could feel each other's presence and uh, we were sharing little tips. You know, you'd, you'd a hand balancer, we'd be practicing with some guy that, you know, could do one arm handstands. And at the time I could do a 10 second handstand and he'd, you know, just be, call me over and be like, hey, you know, like, try this, try this, try this. And it was just, again, so open and inclusive and sharing and, and no one was threatened, you know, by how, uh, adept they were at the at the movement and uh yeah it, it that definitely affected me and so when we got back we opened our studio and called it rise yoga and movement arts because uh, we wanted to sort of honor that uh, experience and and to the degree that we could bring it into a yoga studio and so we did that with varying success. You know, um, our our practices are are a little bit uh, at the time we're we're more movement based and moving into that realm. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> scratching my throat. But um, uh, but we uh, uh, um, uh, we found some of that as well as some of that pushback of like, wait a second, we're trying to do something really great and uh radical and and you're gonna feel the way that we felt you know by sort of being in a community that's so open and sharing in terms of knowledge in terms of practice in terms of uh inclusiveness in that way and um yeah it, it was a uh, initially uh, i think uh it, it was for me um something that uh was ahead of my time and ahead of my tool set as a teacher, you know, because again, I, I, even though I had this grand plan and intention, I sort of wanted to ram it down people's face, you know, and be like, this is the way it needs to be, you know, like, this is how everyone should practice and uh, what's wrong with you people. And, and again, no one ever reacts well to, to that type of approach, you know, even though that wasn't actually how I was behaving, yeah. uh, when I didn't feel as if, you know, it, it was being received, I, I would question, you know, either 
myself or um, you know or the community itself you mm. know so it was, it was an interesting time but again I, I think that that is a, a, a valuable experience for a teacher of of, of going out there a little bit um, being less refined than we uh, are maybe uh, at uh, what what it is that we did in the past you know it's like I have this sequence I teach the heck out of it and uh you know i can always just rely on that sequence you know or you can try to articulate something a little bit different um and try to get someone to engage with with you and and if they don't um it can be a valuable experience if we're uh receptive to it but at the time i i wasn't really receptive to it i was just like Ugh, this is ridiculous you know but i think i think like um you can these experiences can benefit you if you're introspective about it. Mm. If you're asking yourself, um, how, what am I trying to teach? How's it being received? Uh, why, why is it not being received by some and, and, and by others? And not being so hung up on, uh, I, I want everyone to know, do it my way or, or to, mm. to know. And I, I actually think that giving up the... You can relieve a lot of pressure off your shoulders if you give up the what wanting to be like a guru, mm. because I I remember I said recently in class I said look I'm figuring this shit out as I go, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, and I'm sharing with you what I what I'm learning as I go, um, as opposed to I this is the way it is and I've always known it to be this way, and I have I've I've personally find that my I enjoy teaching my classes a lot more now because I'm. I don't pretend to know it all. Mm-hmm. I'll say, look, I tried this the other week. And what I found is if I turn my hand slightly out that way, I notice this, try that. Mm-hmm. And, and I speak more like that now. And it's, it makes me, um, it, it takes pressure off my, off my shoulders. But uh, why don't you actually go back to a point you made about Burning Man? Cause I, I thought you made the point about, um, people sharing moving move different ways but the other point you made about your first experience at burning man about how people interact with each other is really interesting because we we live more individual lifestyle individual individualistic lifestyles now and when we go to class we kind of have our mats facing towards the teacher and we practice on our own little island and do our thing and you don't and when you're finished you roll up the mat and go home generally and same when you go into the class people don't tend to talk to each other just sit down on their mat and wait for, and it's all quiet and a bit somber sometimes like in a lot of yoga studios and uh i i in bali i went to this cacao ceremony mm-hmm. with uh, johan kest and we were dancing. We were doing like five minute eye gazing where you just put 10 minutes. You're just staring at the person's eyes. And I thought, okay, this wouldn't work in a public class on a Wednesday evening after, you know, with a bunch of people that just finished work because there, it'd be too out of their comfort zone. But at the same time, I, I think it's important to, um, to examine like how, how much is that or how much of yoga is, our relationship with other people sure you know and but it's it is a very difficult thing to incorporate because that's just the struggle we were talking about earlier about <laughs> like wanting to give people an enjoyable experience but also to, to move them to mm. shift them in terms of their perspective or to to encourage them to think about how they think uh, sure. and, and how they perceive their life yeah. um that's something uh, absolutely. Uh, that that's uh, uh, again uh, one thing in uh, movement mapping. Uh, what I try to do is create uh, uh, some fluidity where we can. Um, uh, I've already talked about uh, sort of dealing with different physical capacities, but one thing that we maybe don't consider as much is cognitive capacities in terms of what people are comfortable with, how quickly they pick up patterns or concepts and um and how much stamina they may have you know so as i said there there are always going to be periods of time where we're going to just zone out and do something familiar so i have uh pieces that are yoga vinyasa sequences that that we just uh, after we've done some 
things that are new that we move into that as just a resting phase for their mind. Um, mm. cause I, I want to honor that, you know, it's a, that's, that's, uh, again, you know, sort of coming back to me five years ago, uh, that that's actual teaching is, is not necessarily, um, presenting, uh, the best, uh, method or approach, but, but, uh, adapting it, you know, in a way that is in, that allows students to engage, uh, regardless of where they are, regardless of their, um, uh, you know, what they, what they like and what they don't like from the practices, uh, I can shift back to something that is very familiar to them and give them that experience when I see maybe that there's an opportunity to, to move the needle a little bit, as you said, it's, it's, that's also there too. That's available physically. That's available, uh, in terms of complexity, that's available in terms of, of introspection of, 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 uh, giving students opportunities to make choices and, and to observe why they made those choices. So mm. that's something that I think has helped me, uh, to be more fluid in the moment of, of, of being able to shift course and say, well, this isn't working. This is too complex or I've just been talking too long and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it may be and, and, uh, and just move into something that's going to be beneficial for them, you mm -hmm. know. But you touched on it there about the cognitive processes mm -hmm. and actually how to you have a, a thing called um mind mapping as mm -hmm. well uh, i think it's eight week meditation course yes and one of the components of that which i find really interesting from speaking to devin kelly is the the narrative excavation right yeah, um, yeah. and and how to sometimes people go to yoga class and the the t like i went to a class i mean I, you know, to be straight up my, my girlfriend said it as well uh, sorry, not my girlfriend, my friend who was at the class with me, um, Doug. Um, he said that the teacher was speaking in, it was like someone uh, acting to be a yoga teacher. Mm. Very abstract language, very um, talking about, um, you know, it was all like strict yoga philosophy, mm -hmm. which is fine. But when you're using a lot of Sanskrit or you're using, um, referring to people that some people may never heard of, um, things get a little bit lost, sure. you know, and I, I, I respect someone that has that much knowledge and can, I mean, they were great at what they were doing, but for some people in the class, you could tell they were just like, this is, this is, um, too foreign to me. I, I mm -hmm. can't get it. Well, what I like about the, um, uh, the approach of the mind mapping from what I know of it is, um, that it's, it's kind of, um, very, uh, basic but effective psychology mm. why do we tell ourselves certain stories why mm. do we have these narratives in our head where have they come from and what how can we bring it to the bring it to the surface and address them and realize that you know um i don't want to oversimplify it but well actually maybe you can explain sure. better than I can. <laughs> yeah no it's uh, you're right in in a way it's it's a uh, i mean uh, that uh working with devon i, I worked with devon personally for for quite a while and mm -hmm. um uh, yeah he one thing that uh stands out to me about his teaching uh which uh, you can compare to what you were just describing from someone that may have a, a vast knowledge of a subject that i'm not familiar with uh with terminology and a language that i'm not familiar with uh is, is devon was uh focused on making sure that i got what he was trying to say and mm -hmm. he had many ways of saying it um all of them with the aim of uh of of helping me to understand what he thought was important mm -hmm. so if you're thinking about you know or if you're talking about yogic philosophy and you think it's important um and you're sharing these 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 um uh, these teachings um then i think that that should be Goal number one is is make sure that that students are are understanding what it is that you're saying and uh, that you're able to say it in many ways and use metaphor and use stories and examples and things like that uh, that are going to land for for the students. You mm -hmm. know that's that's definitely uh, uh, something that I took from Devin. I, I think he's masterful at that. And uh, in terms of the mind mapping, it's a uh, uh, one of the things that was interesting to me and one thing that, that sort of, or, or what 
narrative excavation, uh, it's Devin's practice, uh, what it, it, um, uh, what interested me, what, what I was interested about, uh, in learning in my own introspective practice and what it provided for me was why do I continue to seek distraction even when I'm, uh, uh, when when all things are sort of clear, I, I know what I want. Um, at least, you know, I, I think I do. I, I think I want some inner peace, and I think I want to practice for two hours and, and be really focused and that sort of thing, and, and I want to do all of these things. And, and why do I get so off track, you know? Um, and so uh, the, the narrative excavation is, is about digging into that process, the sort of the maladaptive pro, uh, patterns that we have. Um, and so the mind mapping course is sort of like a, um, a taste of that. But uh, what, I, what I think of that as is sort of it's, it's like we are developing our muscles or our attributes in terms of our physical training. This is what I would identify as maybe important attributes to develop in terms of a, a mental mindset training or a, a introspective training. So the it, it sort of goes through using meditation as a means to develop something through meditation. So mm-hmm. uh, oftentimes I had sat and meditated and, and uh, spent 10, 15, 20 minutes just sort of watching my breath. And <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes it would, you know, be sort of easy. Sometimes it was such a struggle and, you know, I didn't know why. And I kept, how much longer do I have to be here? And that sort of thing. And um, so uh, that, uh, I didn't really have a tool to examine what was going on in that moment. I just knew that, you know, sort of like, again, this whole idea of handstands of like, just kick up a thousand times and it will get better. Um, but it wasn't, you know, mm. so the the narrative excavation was like, oh, there are reasons why I seek distraction. There are deep-seated reasons why I, I seek distraction, things that I'm attached to um, that are very powerful, um, that are under the surface of, of, of this persona that I've created. And a lot of the persona that I've created is, is to either cover these things or to show attributes that prove them wrong or, or whatever it may be. And so um, anyways, the, the movement mapping, uh, uh, mind mapping uh, practice is something that I'm trying to, uh, uh, it, it's, a go, it's an online eight-week course, and it's also mm-hmm. going to be something that I want to complement the movement mapping. You know, so movement mapping being neuromuscular communication um, and developing neuromuscular communication via movement and via patterns and via um, creating flows and things of that nature. And <clears throat> and then the mind mapping is going to be sort of that introspective component of that, of understanding uh, why we deviate from this, uh, of, of sort of fine tuning our operating system and and, uh, and staying to uh, the things that are most important to us within our practice. So uh, the mind mapping sort of progressively um, goes through first uh the developing of of focus and of uh, the quickness of identifying uh, what is distracting you from mm-hmm. from your focus from the task that you've chosen and that's something that is sort of interesting is that you know we can go through our whole day and have things going on in our head and never really even notice that we've been ruminating all day and um, and and so just uh, developing a little bit more speed in that um, you know in, in in that attribute of identifying oh that's going on and that's going on and that's going on and and that may be worth sort of paying attention to, Mm -hmm. or it may be worth just coming right back to whatever it was that I'm doing. And then progressively going through a process where we start to see patterns of, of how I break down maybe my focus or, or, you know, certain uh, impulses and drives start to surface uh, via the practice. And then we can start to dig down and dig down and dig down into sort of uh, what maybe is behind them and, and all of the uh, associated behaviors that, uh, that um, uh, play out because of them. You know, so uh, this is very, very fascinating stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean <coughs> they say like that yoga is the you know, the practice of self inquiry. Mm. But I, I do, you know, you, you leave your house in the morning and you'll look in the mirror to see what you look like. 
you know, how's the hair? Mm. How, you know, am I looking respectable or attractive if you're single? Sure. Um, <laughs> but only if you're single. Uh, but um, <laughs> yeah, as you give it up after a couple of <laughs> couple of dates, you're like, you all right, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah. But 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 if only we did the same thing for our thoughts. Mm. You know, like how am I thinking today? Mm. Why, why am I thinking this? And if this situation happens, how can I be introspective and see what maybe I could have done differently? Mm. And I think that um that it's i think some people probably find it difficult to think right okay what's that got to do with doing a handstand Mm, yeah (laughs) but at the same time it's 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 analyzing like why for why for example you said you're getting distracted when you're practicing handstand what are the things that you're ignoring what stories you tell yourself in your head and and how that narrative is a choice isn't it sure like you essentially the one that creates that narrative in your head um I think though that if so, are you saying now that you don't teach public classes, or you still do teach public? <laughs> um, I I will teach public classes at in uh, in Guernsey. Uh, I'm going to be teaching regularly pretty soon. Okay. Um, but yeah, if there was a period of time where I wasn't teaching public classes, and uh, after my first um, uh, yoga studio, uh, I think that uh, one of our uh, goals for Guernsey is to keep it more low key, uh, more about just being with the with our local community, teaching maybe ten to fifteen classes instead of twenty five to thirty, which we used to do, um, and uh, and traveling more and, and prioritizing more um, te- teaching the movement mapping uh, courses. So. And doing retreats and doing, yeah, um, yeah. It's it's interesting. I was just uh, uh, talking to Brian about that. Uh, it's uh, the the retreats are. Uh, I, I, the first retreat I did in Greece uh, was wonderful because I um, I got to take my daughter to that and um, and uh, experience Greece when I wasn't teaching and uh, retreats get teaching schedules and too brutal. I mean, you may be teaching two classes uh, per day or something like that. And so I got a lot of time with my daughter exploring Greece. Um, and it was like a win-win for me in that, you know, it's like we got to sort of have a little mini vacation and um, I also got to teach and uh, yeah, so it was cool. But this one, because we just had another baby, um, uh, we sort of decided it's probably not a good idea that we travel as a family mm. uh, for a couple of years. Um, so I'm not sure that I'll do uh, any retreats in the next two years or so. Um, but also I had this idea of, of, of doing more of a structured retreat, uh, in line with the movement mapping, um, uh, as a means to sort of really give students a, uh, foundation in movement, uh, in terms of, uh, the everyday essentials, which I think is again, sort of a missing, uh, piece of, of not only yoga practice, but of modern human beings. We just don't move enough. We don't move our joints enough. There's always going to be deficiencies in our joints no matter how healthy you are. Um, so just giving a, a sort of a, a practice, I was almost thinking of it as a um, like a detensive uh, and in terms <laughs> of uh, in terms of like the um, tensegrity model of uh, by uh, creating more uh, 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 harmony in sort of how the body uh, tension lines uh, are, are working um, that you, naturally are under more stress throughout your day in terms of uh, the the tone of your muscles. And so um, doing something that was very um, uh, sort of, uh, um, what's the word I'm thinking of here? Um, uh, thinking of uh, just a pre-organized uh, in terms of, of what we're going to do um, and making sure that it's like a very uh, structured uh, retreat style thing. So mm. that's something that's... Uh, in in the brain but uh we'll see if that that works out what about online stuff because obviously you produce your own content are you going <laughs> to do more of that um uh, yeah it's it's uh the the online stuff for me it's it's again it's it's sort of um uh personally just it's sort of weird looking into a camera and, and teaching with no students there. Um, so that's something that I'm, I'm new to. Uh, I'm sort of refining uh, uh, 
uh, my my video framing skills uh, have been uh, suspect at best. <laughs> um, so so yeah, there's uh, there's all types of little refinements. I'm I'm uh, interested in some uh, video edit editing um, uh, software and and uh, trying to sort of uh, be able to graphically uh, show some of the concepts that I do. Uh, because um, in the movement movement mapping course, uh, we we pack it in in terms of information technique, um, and uh, and on the course manual there's videos for everything that we've done, and the students really appreciated that because mm. it's they're leaving with a lot, and um, and then they're going to have that to reference over and over and over again. So so that's yeah I, I see that as a really valuable tool for teaching um, uh, with the movement mapping and then. All also with students that want to, to practice with me that that aren't uh, uh, you know local in Guernsey now mm. um, that they're practicing with me online so so that's cool yeah but it's cool that you're, you're doing <coughs> all of that like as in you know you're not collaborating on the platform you're doing the videos you can buy them on your website mm. buy the courses on your website and um, yeah that like you know you, you've ex explored all of the the avenues essentially but as you said you have to you have to make adjustments as your life changes mm -hmm. you know you get a family retreats aren't as easy to go away for a week sure here, yeah here and there um so are you going to london tomorrow you uh you went your next workshops in london yes um i'm flying well i have to actually take a connection from uh, uh dublin to bristol and then bristol to um Guernsey uh, yeah. but then in two weeks I'll be in London oh, it's um, two weeks two weeks from now yeah okay. I'll be uh, at stretch London uh, which is a cool place it's a uh, uh, it's got gymnastics rings it's got um, uh, uh, wall ladders and uh, it's got just a big open space and uh, they seem really uh, uh, open to uh, to more mixed movement uh, practices so yeah. I've heard of, I think Dan Dan Morgan, I think Dan Morgan, I think he teaches there, but mm -hmm. he's a, he's been in the podcast. But um, and then after London, what's what's after then? Stockholm, Stockholm. Okay, yeah. I'm, exci <laughs> I'm excited. Stockholm, yeah. Nice, um, but yeah, no, it's it's cool. I'll be at Yoga Stirka, um, and uh, uh, yeah, just a, a, a studio. Um, uh, one of their teachers reached out to me, and then uh, uh, spoke with the studio. Uh, management management group and uh they're super cool too they they seem to be again uh, very open and receptive to um not that uh I'm, I'm teaching anything extreme uh but i think again it's it's a uh, uh it's it is it has been a response both in my shift um to more uh more tools in terms of, of teaching beyond maybe the typical yoga box that uh, that what I'm saying matter of factly is is that what you're doing is wrong, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I try to make a point of of, of not only um, uh, sharing what what is ringing true to me but uh, but also that uh, what we're doing is 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 just highly contextual. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's all about what your capacity is that's what um that's that's what determines whether or not something is good for you to do or not mm -hmm. and so there just needs to be maybe some more uh, thought into how we can progress a uh, sequence for a student so that they can sort of find those things out for themselves yeah. you know through the practice yeah and by the way i should we should say that like oh i should say that you know a, 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 a standard vinyasa yoga class is brilliant for you mm -hmm. if you're doing it three times a week but if you're doing it every single day twice a day what we're, what we're saying I'm, I'm sure i hope you agree with me is that it's important to re-examine why you're doing certain movements and understand that it is great to move but if you're always moving the exact same way mm. the the benefit the, the the returns diminish quite quickly um and that's why it's just important to re-examine how you move how you think as well and yeah. um so yes there is value in doing vinyasa 100 percent um but um to question everything <laughs> yeah it's it's a uh, uh, again i think one thing that uh would be uh, valuable to add to um, a movement practice is full range movement you know so a lot of it is sitting in one joint position for a, an extended period of time and and as you said the, there's diminishing returns to that and uh if you do it continuously there can also be consequences you know and so mm -hmm. it's uh, and uh, there are 
different. Uh, I, I use my wife as an example a lot because she uh, was a dancer um, and uh, she her first yoga class was in full dancer and it was, you know, completely nothing for her in yeah. terms of uh, a big deal. Like she hadn't trained for it. She hadn't um, stretched. <laughs> she was just like, oh, yeah, this, oh, this is great. She put her foot in her mouth. No, that's a joke. But um, <laughs> but she uh, but she she had those capacities from a former activity, you know, and so someone that's an uh, was an athlete growing up can do bakasana immediately and it's not a big deal because their capacities are there and so it's it's just that uh you know when when people walk into a yoga studio we have no idea what their capacities are and i think just in general no system can be perfect uh in terms of of uh doing everything that the body needs mm. um so just adding some full range movement into your daily life or into a yoga sequence uh, i think does the body good in mm. that regard and sort of filling in some of the gaps that modern human beings are are more more than likely to have mm. yeah. yeah absolutely um so workshops all that stuff you've got going on. If people want to know more about you, where Justin? <laughs> oh, they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> JustinWolferYoga.com. JustinWolferYoga.com. Yeah. Because <laughs> I because the Wolfer, it, I I thought it was Wolf. Yeah. Initial, just that, at first glance, but Wolfer that's obviously important. Yeah. So ER, I, yeah. I, ne I never heard that name. So yeah. Uh, yeah. It would be pretty. It it is Germanic. Yeah. Mm. Um. Uh, but it'd be pretty cool if it was wolf but, uh, <laughs> but it's wolf -er. i'm wolfier than uh than, Your average than the other yeah than the other wolves yeah well, cool, man. that's yeah. it we're done oh awesome man well i appreciate chatting with you brother thank you thanks man <laughs> that's it we are done we're out of time well time's an illusion supposedly but i've got things to do and i'm sure you have as well um um dot com a response of this podcast what does that mean that means that if you're a man or you know a man and he wants to do yoga or move and look good at the same time and look after the environment, you don't want that man to be naked. Or, well, not in public anyway. So he's got to buy clothing. And if you're going to buy clothing, why not buy stuff that is doing something good for the environment, is using sustainable manufacturing processes or processes, I'm not sure, and uh, get, some, get some money off while you shop. So if you go to om.com forward slash hashtag TYLP and then you choose out what gear you want, what clothing you want, put in your promo code, which is Kevin, you get 15% off. So again, ohmme.com forward slash hashtag TYLP as in the Yoga Life podcast. Put in promo code Kevin at checkout. You get your 15% off or your clobber. Finally, this podcast was brought to you by and supported by Small Changes. Local store here in Dublin, Ireland. They, they do, uh, they're a whole food store that believe in supporting the local community and uh, selling, stocking and selling organic produce. They're opening one up close to me in Glasnevin. So if you're in the area in Glasnevin, you're going Small Changes, give me a shout. I'll come around and say hello. Um, and uh, they don't have a, a, an online offering. So just go down there. You can check them out for smallchanges.ie and bring your fulfillable cup, as I always say, and get yourself 50 cent off your cup of char. And next month is July. A couple of things going on in July. First, I've got Handstand Workshop. He was overhead at the Elbow Room in Smithfield, July 6th, which is a Saturday, 2 p.m. Come along. It's uh, We've got a few, it's about half full at the moment. So if you go to... Uh, my website you can find out more information about that this final event we have on is the teacher training open day which is 27th of july also a saturday 3 p.m in yoga hub castle knock so if you're thinking of becoming a yoga teacher you want to or maybe you just want to deepen your practice which a lot of people do that's how i started uh, come along and the course itself starts in september it's for 10 months but if you want to just go along meet me meet the other trainees potential trainees and ask some questions and get to see the studio check out what the vibe is as david brent would say then uh, you can because it's free which is always good you just go to kevinboyyoga.ie and if you go to events and retreats you'll see all information there uh, pop us a little mail in the little form that we have 
and uh, I'll get back to you in a jiffy. Thanks so much for listening. I really, really appreciate it. I love doing this and uh, I'm honored that you take the time to listen. Catch up with you next week. Bye.